that you are here. I am Shirley Luce. I am a lay servant of the Western North Carolina Conference, and I am also the office manager here at Harrisburg. And I am always joyful to have be in worship with all of you, whether it's here or whether I'm sitting in the pews with you. It's a wonderful thing to come to worship. I'm excited that in Tony Ruth and Wes's absence, as they are still on vacation, um, hopefully having a wonderful time, um, Pastor Steve Cheney is with us this morning to bring a word to us, and I'm excited, and you'll be um, inspired by his spirit this morning. So as we begin, I want you to take a deep breath in and exhale out, and let us join together in prayer. Let us stand. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open and all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily glorify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together, Blessed Assurance. Let us pray. Almighty God, we bow down before you. With our voices, we sing praise to you. Our hands are lifted up to give you honor, and our eyes are open to behold your blessing. As we gather today, we pray that you will fill our hearts and minds and soul, transforming us to make us more like you. Have mercy upon us as we confess our sin. Your blessings are many, yet we tend to squander them. 
We yearn for the possessions that our neighbors enjoy. Envy and greed and selfishness consume us. Satisfaction eludes us. Quiet our longing for material riches and help us to trust in you, Lord. Help us to understand that satisfaction comes from our service to you. We lift up the young people this morning as they leave for a mission trip to be in service, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Bless them and equip them for the work ahead of them and awaken in them a renewed spirit of service. Give patience and strength to the adults who lead these young people to a greater understanding of their spirituality and purpose. Lord, there are so many things this morning that are in need of prayer. And we lift up to you those who mourn, especially our hearts reach out to those families in Surfside, Florida, and to all those working at that site for strength and a continued as they continue to work in a difficult time. We lift to you the unrest of this world, Lord, and yes, Lord, we are well aware that that unrest includes us right here. We pray for the healing of this world, that we as Christians have the strength to stand for justice and equality. Give us the strength not to stand in the shadows, but to boldly follow your direction, Lord, to create a way that all people come together as one in unity, in human dignity. Loving God, creator of all that lives, help us to remember we are all God's children. Hear our prayers, Lord, as we lift up to you those who have asked for prayer. Nancy Helms and her family, Chuck Green, Janet Becker, Ross and Leah Cavanaugh, Maureen Floro, Pat Miller. Lord, you know that we, you hear our prayers, whether we lift them aloud or we lift them silently from our hearts. Hear our prayers. Lord, you have chosen us to follow your lead, to carry with us a towel and basin of hospitality, to empty ourselves so we can reach out to those who are hurt and to be filled with conviction so to see your purpose revealed. Aware of our covenant with you, we go forth and give thanksgiving guided by your spirit, praying together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Our scripture lesson comes today from Ephesians, the first chapter beginning with verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, the, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplished all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had, and had believed in him, were marked with a special seal of his promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. As we sing um, this next hymn, if you are three years old through the first grade, um, you may go with Miss Angela to children's worship. 
Let us stand and sing this wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace. Harrisburg. It's such a privilege and an honor to be with you this morning. I'm so excited that Tony Ruth and Wes have offered me an invitation to worship with you. It's always good to be at Harrisburg. You know, I was thinking this morning as I preached the first service and now in the second service that it's really chilly in here. Like they, Whoever is in control of the HVAC has put it like at 59 degrees. And the funny thing is, is I was listening to NPR the other day and found out that they keep air, airlines, you know, those jets really cold too. And the reason they keep them so cold is to reduce nausea during turbulence. So I guess that whoever's running this <laughs> is just thinking there's going to be a turbulent sermon. So here we go. Here we go. But it's so nice to be here. It's it's really lovely to look at the renovations. The family was here early for the early service, and we walked around. We saw the new construction. We see the progress. It's great to see old friends and family here, but it's also wonderful just to see new faces, especially after the year 2020. Who knew what we were going to come back into? And so it's just, it's my first time up here at the pulpit since the pandemic. And what an honor, what a 
what a privilege it's been. But it's occurred to me that many of you might not know me and might not know what I do. I'm the university pastor at UNC Charlotte. UNC Charlotte, just down the road, if you work there or been there, you might realize it's the 14th fastest growing university in the U.S. Think about that. It is rapidly growing. It's the fastest growing university in the Carolinas. It has the largest undergraduate enrollment in the Carolinas. It's such a place and a field for mission. Thousands of students come there every year. 19, 18-year-olds come there and really start to venture and make the lasting decisions that they're going to make throughout life at a college campus. The United Methodist Church has actually reduced our funding quite a bit. They reduced it during the pandemic by 20%. So it occurred to me also, maybe the church doesn't, doesn't know what we do. You know, it breaks my heart sometimes to be able to look at a student and be in worship with a student, to watch them grow spiritually, to help them reach out to their neighbors. And then what do I say? What do I say? The, the church universal, the bishops, the district superintendents, the big church steeple pastors, they just care for you less by 20%. You know, it's hard. It's, it's hard. What do you say? And the church in response says, well, you know, we're dying. They admit it. The denomination says, you know, we're struggling. We're losing people. Pews aren't as full. Money's down. You know, you have to figure out how to raise the money on your own. Sorry you have to figure that out. Sorry you're out there in the mission field. We'll do the best we can, but the church is in a lot of trouble. And you know, that's such an odd thing to be told by those who are in power. It's like, you know, we realize the church is dying, so what are we going to cut first? Kids, children, youth, young adults. And then maybe the church won't die. It's so ironic. It's such a strange place to be in. But I want to assure you, despite whatever cuts come our way in campus ministry, we're doing the best we, we awfully can. You know, last year during COVID, we reached the campus ministry, your United Methodist campus ministry, just down the road at UNC Charlotte, reached 5,700 students. We engaged with, we connected to 5,700 students. 5,700 students know about Niner United, your United Methodist campus ministry. We work relentlessly trying to reach out to students to make sure they know there is a home for them, that we are the voice in a time of loneliness and despair, that we give hope in a time of distress. And you, you play a part in this. You help us do this. But when you look at the numbers, and I've crunched the numbers, I've got to tell a story to the bishops, you know? I've crunched the numbers, and you look at that. 5,700 students. Did you know that more than 90% of the churches in the USA, 90% don't even reach 350 people in a year. 90% of the churches don't even reach 350 people in a year, yet your campus ministry has reached 5,700 students a year. And you know, unfortunately, some of these students, they get tired of me, you know? They just like, i got enough of Steve, i got to go and graduate. And so in order to grow, we have to grow exponentially. We have to keep at it. We have to always be vigilant of trying to reach out to new students. We miss a lot, but we try our best to make sure students know that we are there for them. The church is present for them. In order to just flatline, to stay the same, to sustain in our ministry, we have to reach out by 30% every year. We have to grow by 30% just to stay flatline because that's how many students we lose in a year because of attrition. It's a normal process. We want them to, we want them to grow and mature and get jobs and, and go on and be healthy alumni. But just imagine if you had to grow Harrisburg United Methodist Church by 30% every year just to stay the same not even to go over the edge and reach more people. By comparison, Community of Hope is a church in Palm Beach, Florida. It's a United Methodist church. It is the fastest growing United Methodist church in the nation. The five-year growth rate, 20%. We have to outpace the fastest growing United Methodist church in the nation by 10% just to sustain the work of campus ministry. Oh, and by the way, Palm Beach, Florida, the average age is 70 
the average age of campus ministry is 19. You know, it's a different thing. You know, it might be easier to reach 70 plus in Palm Beach, Florida for the heart and the love of God than a 19 year old who might have been discouraged by the work and the ministry of the church. Oh, campus ministry, it's tough. And I'm on a soapbox now. Sorry, you're just going to have to roll with me. You didn't come here this morning to hear about the complexity of our brokenness, you know, that we are broke and we need support. But hey, we're here together and maybe God has put this on our heart. I've kept running the numbers and thinking, how do I tell the bishops? How do I tell these leaders in the church that campus ministry is vital and important and make a comparison to the local church, what they know best? Because obviously they don't know what's going on in campus ministry. You know when a new church is built, they assign one parking space for every two and a half people. I don't know how you carve that up, but that just implies that people come together to worship, that people already come associated with others. Now, that, that's not true for everyone, but there are spouses who come together. Maybe a child comes with their parent or a grandchild comes with their grandparents. And so it is assumed that two and a half people will come as a family unit. There are family units coming to church. Obviously, there are people who come solo, but there are others who come connected to someone. And I'm willing to bet, of course, not here, but some who come connected to another might come, you know, grudgingly. <laughs> they might not want to come, but they sort of feel like they have to come with someone else. I saw the way you looked at, don't, I don't want to look, at, you know, I saw that look that you gave to your spouse over there. We're not going to, we're, we're not going to go there. But if you think about campus ministry, and I've run the numbers, less than 10% come with someone else. Less than 10% of these students come with someone else, so they're always coming alone. So when we reach 5,700 students, it's not like we reach a couple thousand family units. We're reaching individuals who have decided that they want to come. No one's forcing them to be there. No one's parents is telling them to be there. That your United Methodist Campus Ministry at UNC Charlotte is reaching these 5,700 students fair and square that we're doing the work that needs to be done on your local college campus. And you know another thing, I've been in this for like 20 years now. This is like my home church. You've seen my kids grow up here and go off to school. For 20 years, that means that like no one's just putting up with Steve. You know what I mean? Like they're not like, oh, I'll, I'll outride this pastor. Of course, that doesn't happen at Harrisburg, you know? But you know those folks, think of the church next door or whatever. They're like, oh, I don't like what's going on with this pastor. I don't like his or her sermon styles. I don't like their motives. I'll just wait for the next pastor. It's like they have inherited some toxicity in their church. But not me, I didn't really inherit that. Because these students come and go and they're there and I didn't inherit a single one of them. You know, speaking of inheritance, I was reading an article about a church janitor. He lived in Vermont, and every day he would come and he would mop the church and clean the church. He also cleaned the local hospital and the local library. He only had two pairs of clothes. He drove this old beat-up Toyota Corolla, and he chopped wood on the side to make an extra living. It seemed like he was struggling, but truth be told, he was just being conservative because when he died, he left $4.8 million of his estate to the local hospital, and he left $1.2 million of his estate to the local library. Now, the article didn't say if he left anything to his church, <laughs> but can you imagine that? Can you imagine? If there's anyone out here who's driving a beat-up Toyota Corolla, campus ministry could certainly be part of your bequest. It's Niner Unana, N-I-N-E-R. The campus ministry needs support. The church needs support. But can you imagine, just can you imagine inheriting that much money? Six million dollars for the good of the community. Because this person 
decided to save and save and save and invest in whatever he did and to leave all this for the sake of others. That's what we're called to do, to leave something behind, to create a legacy in our life. We're called in some way to bequest something of importance and significance to others. Maybe you've already decided that's your family or this church or the, the shelter in uptown Charlotte. But we're called to do something important with our life. We're called to make a purpose and, and to live into our design and have a sense of something greater than ourselves in life. I think of my grandparents when I think of building a sense of purpose. My granddaddy, he used to teach me how to crab on the marsh of Topsail Island. I loved to go to their beach house at Topsail. It was only 30 minutes north of my house, but it was like going to the Magic Kingdom to spend time with my grandparents and going out and crabbing in the marsh, or he would teach me to surf fish, and he would catch these huge fish, and I would catch these little tiny bait. But he was like, you know, Steve, if this is what you want to do, if you feel called to fish or you want to fish, I'll teach you how to do that and you can catch the biggest fish in your life. But if you put your heart and your mind to anything, you have the drive because God has given you the gift. Sometimes I think that it would sure be nice to go back and visit my grandparents' oceanfront house today with my kids, but long ago they sold it, you know, before it was worth anything. You know, these developers now, they're building these huge mansions oceanfront. They're multi-million dollar homes with elevators. And just to think that that could have been in our family, just to think that that could have been left behind for others to enjoy. No one had that foresight. No one was thinking financially about my grandparents' oceanfront property. But my granddaddy did leave me one thing. He left me his... Husk Farner weed eater. That thing's 45 years old now. I hate mowing the grass. I hate doing the lawn. But you know, every time I go out there, yesterday, in fact, I was out there weed eating with my granddaddy's 45 year old orange husk varna. The shaft's bent, oil leaking from it everywhere. It's a wreck. It took me 14 cranks to get the thing started. But he left it for me. It's something that he left behind for me, and I feel a sense of responsibility, like I'm not supposed to squander this. You know, I'm gonna go to my grave using that weed eater. Like there is a sense of responsibility. Steve, you have some type of purpose with this weed eater, that you have to use it because my granddaddy thought that I should have it. It was like he was passing on something of himself to me. I've yet to figure out, and to materialize the metaphor between weed eater and my granddaddy, but I know that every time I do the lawn, which I hate, by the way, I do think of good memories of being with my grandparents, grudgingly going out there, working, sweating, just being nasty, but remembering that I was loved, remembering I'm part of something bigger than myself, a family, and that family has passed on so much to me, not in ways of material support, unless you consider the Husqvarna something of material, but no, in values and in grace and in passing peace and in love. That is what my grandparents left to me. That's what Paul was trying to tell us. At least he was trying to tell the church in Ephesus this. I know it's not fair for Richard to come up here and read Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I mean, he, he writes crazy. Like the first sentence that Richard was reading had 47 words in it. Sorry, Richard, I apologize. But Paul was just essentially trying to tell us that we've inherited something great. Now I know that you might think, you know, Harrisburg's a meek church. You know, we're blessed, but we're not the big steeple in Charlotte you know, or Atlanta, but you have been blessed. Paul telling the church in Ephesus, you might think disparagingly of yourself, but you have been blessed. Paul is saying to the people in Ephesus, yes, there are challenging days ahead. Yes, you have 
seen difficulty. Yes, you may have gotten a, a bad report from the doctor, or you may have conflict in your house, or you may be living paycheck to paycheck, or you might be looking for where your next meal's coming from, or you might have troubles with your grandkids or your, your kids, or you might have relationship issues in your family. You may have lost your best friend, but Paul is telling the church in Ephesus, you still are blessed. That we've obtained an inheritance that we have been given something of value and worth. And it's better than a 45-year-old daggone Husqvarna weed eater. What we've obtained an inheritance from is from Jesus Christ himself. That we have been given hope and love and grace and peace. Paul goes on to say that we have, in fact, inherited redemption. That's a big word. Redemption. That implies that the world works together in harmony, that we are blessed, that we have received something of great value because we are loved. And that love means all so much as redemption for the world. And you know, it's not just about us and our difficulty and our trials, that we are called to share that blessing and inheritance with others. It's not some prosperity gospel message where the preacher says, you will be blessed if you do this or that. No, Paul is saying you have already been blessed. God has already given you value. God has already given you the peace. And now our responsibility is not to squander the inheritance, that we must also give that value and worth and peace to one another. And that when we look at ourselves every day in the mirror, we have to remind ourselves that we are of worth and value. And so it makes perfect sense in Paul's mind to the church of Ephesus and to us today that when we look in someone else's eyes that we see worth in them. That we, when we go into a neighborhood that seems depressed or poor, that we not look at it as depressed or poor, but see the value in it, see the gifts in it, see the blessing there, that God has blessed every one of us, that we are all brothers and sisters. We have to look at one another as if all of us have worth and value. In order to receive and see the full redemption of what God is doing in this kingdom, in this world, is that we have to work together to see the blessing in others. It's not that you're giving funds to help the shelter. It's that you see those who are homeless as just as valuable and worthy as you, that they are our true neighbors, that they are our true brothers and sisters that everyone is welcome to the community of faith, that we come together and worship and we hear the scripture read and spoken, that we come and we grow in Christ and we grow in the inheritance. We're taught how to use the inheritance. We're taught how to love more. We're taught how to be kind to our neighbors. We're taught how to infuse the spiritual gifts. Paul is reminding the church in Ephesus, yes, there's hard days. We all get it, that there are challenging times in our lives. It's not all easy. But nonetheless, we are blessed. That we are worthy and valuable. The redemption of the world that Paul is speaking of is the redemption that in Christ we are made whole. And we cannot be made whole and feel proud of ourselves unless our brother and sister is made whole as well. We can't have a chip on our shoulder and say, we are the church. We're doing it this way because this is the way God wants us unless we see the value and worth in our brothers and sisters, that together we are this church, that we are forgiven collectively, that we are given peace collectively that this is one mission, one church, one mind of Christ. This is the inheritance that we have been given. So my prayer for Harrisburg and for me and my family is that we treat this inheritance like I try to treat my granddaddy's 45-year-old Husqvarna weed eater. I mean, I might kick it and get mad with it some days. You know, Life can be hard and we want to get upset. Sometimes it makes me cry. 
Sometimes it makes me sad. Sometimes I feel like yelling at it, but I can't squander it. I can never squander the gift of love and grace from Jesus Christ. I've been given love, I have to give love. I've been given hope, I have to give hope. I've been given forgiveness, so I have to look at my neighbor and forgive that sucker too. In fact, the biggest sucker I have to forgive is myself. You have been given a great inheritance of such value and glory. Remember that. Wake up tomorrow morning, look in the mirror, brush those beautiful teeth, and say to yourself, I am worthy and blessed, and give God thanks. And if you're into the mood of giving, it's Niner, you're not an N-I-N-E-R. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Steve. Let us stand now and state what we believe. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, and Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. within the church walls this morning that the offering plate is in the back and for those of you online there will be a link um, for giving your offering let us pray together gracious and giving God you have poured your blessings on us as you as the rain soaks the sun parched grass on our lawns you have lavished us with redemption forgiveness and grace. When you send the rain to the water the grass, you expect growth in return. Remind us this day as we make our gifts to you that you have been we have been blessed for a purpose, that we might be a blessing to others. May we grow in compassion, in mercy, in longing for justice and love as Christ loved us, in Jesus' name, amen. remind you that the pastors will be gone again this week and Pastor Richard is on a mission trip. Anybody wants to come visit me in the office, you are welcome. <laughs> Just saying, it's going to be a lonely week. That being said, please call if you have any needs. I will do my best and we also have pastors on call if you need a pastoral care. So I don't want you to worry about that. We've got it covered. Okay. 
I also want to say to you, I wanted, inspired by Pastor Steve's message this morning, that we go out into the world today seeing the blessings of the world and then sharing them, sharing that hope and joy, and take some time and meditate and pray and listen to God to hear how he is calling you to be in ministry and how he is calling you to support ministry. In Jesus' name, let us stand and sing the fine hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. with the turbulence of the captain. And I also made up time, I was put on the watch by the choir to be out before 12 o'clock. And I'd also like just to thank Shirley for doing all the parts in the service that said my name because I accidentally forgot. But remember this, <laughs> you have inherited a great worth and value from God, including the love of the Father and the grace of the Son and the communion of the Holy Spirit. So pass it on and share it with the world. Amen. <laughs>